in quietness, recognising that we don't stop often enough, aware that we don't always sit still with you, Lord, as frequently as we should, we come this morning to wait, and in the waiting to meet you already present. We come confessing to being too quick to speak, to do, to organise, when you are already at work, speaking, doing, organising. Help us, we pray, to let go of what we think, so that we can catch a glimpse of what you know, and forgive us when we forget that we are not the ones in charge, you are. So we come to ask you to reveal what you want to do with us, through us, in us, and despite us. Give us, we pray, the courage to let you lead, and the courage too to follow faithfully, for your sake, Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the last Sunday of the Christian year. Next Sunday the story begins again as we start on the Advent journey towards Christmas. Let's not jump ahead though. Today is a Sunday that has its own special name. Today is Christ the King Sunday and the Gospel reading turns to John's version of events. 
You can see the other readings for today listed at the end of this order of service. We listen now though to the tale of Jesus standing before Pilate, accused of planning insurrection and of crowning himself King of the Jews. John chapter 18 verses 33 to 37. Pilate went back into the palace and called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus answered, Does this question come from you or have others told you about me? Pilate replied, Do you think I'm a Jew? It was your own people and the chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No, my kingdom does not belong here. So Pilate asked him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this one purpose, to speak about the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. I know that there's been Christmas stuff in the shops since October, but here we are. We haven't even started opening the advent calendars, and here we are with a snippet of the Easter story. A cream egg, anybody? Today's readings are a gentle reminder that the cute and cuddly events of Christmas, which we're about to hear again, about the birth of a baby in a stable so long ago, that is only the first chapter of a very much longer story in which the baby grows into a man with a voice and a heart for the God who gifted him to the world. And with a voice and a heart too for the people in every generation who share that world. Jesus stands before Pilate, accused of claiming to be King of the Jews. Pilate, with all the might and the power of the Roman Empire behind him, must have looked at the carpenter from Nazareth and thought, really? A king? And in the words and in the silence that followed, as Jesus' eyes met Pilate, Pilate's heart must have missed a beat.
Jesus must have been so frustrating to be around because he doesn't ever mince his words, does he? He doesn't even tone them down a wee bit. He simply says what he thinks needs to be said. And that would be whether he's talking to royalty or a leper, to a judge, a rich ruler or a shunned woman at a well. Whether he's standing before the temple authorities or a Roman governor or a criminal condemned with him, Jesus treats everyone the same and speaks the truth honestly and from the heart. In the conversation we heard from John's Gospel between Jesus and Pilate, that is exactly what Jesus does. He speaks the truth. To get a better understanding of what's going on in that chat between the two men, we need to use a bit of imagination. So let's picture the scene. You have a bashed and bruised Jesus standing before the most powerful figure in the region. The person who has the ultimate say about whether Jesus will live or die. The meeting takes place in the palace and Pilate appears in all his Roman finery, very much in keeping with the grand and intimidating setting in which the encounter is set. By contrast, Jesus is dusty and dirty with his hands bound and bearing the evidence of his having been roughed up. So even before a word is ever spoken, the power dynamics in this conversation are obvious. One of the two has all the power, the other has none. Pilate called for Jesus, we're told, and then just asked him straight, are you the King of the Jews? I think that perhaps the abruptness of the question hints at the frustration that Pilate felt. The frustration, for starters, at being wakened early in the morning before breakfast by a crowd of people demanding he try Jesus there and then. How could he, a Roman, be expected to make sense of these complaints from the local faith community when that faith and their thoughts and traditions were so very different from his own? You have to wonder too how often this kind of thing happened. Were the authorities forever knocking at Pilate's door? Could the governor have been wishing at this point that he had been posted anywhere else. And Jesus doesn't help any. Instead of a simple yes or no answer to his question, Jesus asks Pilate why he asks him if he's king of the Jews. Is it because Pilate really wants to know or is it because this is a line he's been fed by other people? Remember the power dynamics here. The Roman governor is there to keep the people under control. Anyone claiming kingship would be seen to be undermining Pilate's authority. And they would bring with them the threat of an uprising. That was something that Pilate couldn't countenance happening. But Pilate, ever the politician, plays it cool. When Jesus asks him why he asks, Pilate's hands go up in the air. I'm not a Jew, he says. It's your own people who are saying these things. Nothing to do with me. Okay, says Jesus, so if I was a sort of king you fear, would there not have been an army with me to fight for me, to prevent me from being handed over to you? My kingdom is not a worldly kingdom, Jesus tells Pilate. Ah, so you are a king, replies Pilate. Well, it's you who's talking about kings, says Jesus. I am talking about the truth that I was born 
to bring. And Pilate gives up. Truth, he says. What is truth? Utterly exasperated. This is where the reading for this week pauses the action and the conversation. And maybe we should pause there too. With that picture in our mind's eye of the two men, Pilate and Jesus, eyeballing each other. The one with all the obvious trappings of power, the other with nothing more than he stood up in. But with the words, my kingdom does not belong to this world, echoing round and round the room. What did Jesus mean when he said that? My kingdom is not of this world. Was he talking about the kingdom of heaven? About a kingdom elsewhere, up or out there, somewhere else? Or is it possible? Is it possible that Jesus could have been suggesting that the kingdom of heaven he brings is so pulls apart from every other kingdom ever known on this earth? that it doesn't, in that sense, belong to this world because it offers such a very different way of being. Even just a quick look at the sorts of things that Jesus said and did, the people he interacted with, the kind of life that he led, the priorities he had. And you can't help but realise that the kingdom Jesus was forever pointing to was not some pie-in-the-sky thing for when we die. For Jesus, the kingdom of God was to come on earth every bit as much as it was in heaven. Here on this earth was where the fullness of life Jesus talked of and promised was and is to begin. And if that is true, then we need to look again at the two men, at Jesus and Pilate, and ask ourselves some serious questions about the nature of power. We need to ask not so much what power is. We need to ask what power should be, what it should look like, and what it should do. I know it needs a great stretch of the imagination. But Jesus was forever turning what people thought on its head. So what if we were to turn the scene in the palace on its head? What if Jesus was showing us that the most powerful figure in that encounter was not the Roman governor, but the one with bound hands? the one with the bruised body, the one whose fate lay in the hands of someone else. It would fit in with God's son being born in a stable, wouldn't it? And it would fit too with a donkey ride into Jerusalem. Jesus is showing us, even now, an alternative way of living. A way in which there's no lording it over other people. There's no looking for position and honour and prestige. Instead, what there is, is a desire to serve and to give himself for the sake of everyone else. The challenge to us all these years later, the challenge is to find the courage to follow Jesus' example and to live Jesus' kingdom right here and right now as individuals, as a congregation of God's people and as a national church. To live giving to those around us. That would be those directly around us and in the world beyond. And giving without ever tiring of doing that. Giving generously, unselfishly. Jesus, the King of Kings, who redefines kingship forever. Amen.
prayers for others, the world, us. Lord Jesus, for the courage you showed before Pilate and before those of your own who resented the truth you spoke, we give you thanks. Help us, we pray, to find similar courage to listen to the voices of those today who challenge what we are used to thinking and saying and doing. Don't let us, we pray, push them aside. Don't let us cling on to what has I been. Instead, help us to let you lead us to pastures new where we can experience afresh your living love, which is forever reaching out into this world in unexpected ways. In quietness, we bring to you in prayer, Lord Jesus, what worries us about the world, as well as what worries us about our nation and our church. So much uncertainty, so much distrust and suspicion and fear, so much violence and pain. King of Kings, we need your spirit to weave her way through the hearts and minds of all people everywhere, filling us with that peace which goes beyond our understanding and filling us too with a greater respect for you, for your world and for each other. Teach all people everywhere how to live as you did. Teach us to sit lightly to our own needs while others suffer and are pushed aside. And help us deliberately to reach out to help each other for your sake. And for the church, we pray. Help us to let you lead and guide us. Give us the courage to let you reshape and re-energise us. But help us too to be willing to work with you in your ever-expanding vision for this parish and for Presbytery. Speak to us, Lord, and make us listen. We bring you to our more personal prayers. Our prayers for those we know who are coping with loss or with illness, whether physical or mental, as well as our prayers for those facing challenges in work or in relationships, and for those grown older. Hold each one tight, Lord God, be their help, be their healing, and be their hope. These things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and our Saviour and Friend. Amen.
let peace descend upon us, let joy fill our hearts, let hope shape our actions, so may God be glorified. The blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Son and Spirit be with you and be with all those whom you love this day and always. Amen.